Hillary Clinton, the presumptive Democrat nominee for sinister president, and Donald Trump, the preposterous Republican nominee for unimaginable president, have been attacking each other on foreign policy lately. Mrs. Clinton gave a speech last week detailing her criticisms of Trump, and then Trump fired back until the weapon was wrestled from his hand. Hillary began her attack by claiming that Trump was too inexperienced to handle foreign policy. She said, quote, here is a man who has never traded government favors for illegal cash payoffs or recklessly toppled a dictator, plunging an entire region into chaos, or left our people to die and then lied about it to their parents while standing in front of their coffins. These are not things you can learn on the job. I've done them all, and if elected president, I'll be sure to do them again, especially the cash payoff part, unquote. Trump responded to the charges by breaking out of his enclosure, swinging from a tree into a crowded children's area, seizing a three-year-old boy and dragging him through a man-made river. Zoo officials finally brought Trump down with a tranquilizer gun and returned him to his cage, preventing any loss of life. Mrs. Clinton continued to hit Trump on foreign policy by calling his outlook dangerously chaotic. He doesn't really have any ideas, she said, just a series of bizarre attitudes. I, on the other hand, firmly believe that rainbows shoot out of the backsides of suicide bombers, Mexican gangsters are dreamers who only want to come to America to mow my lawn, and Europe is a magical kingdom somewhere across the Silver Sea where everyone has health care and speaks with a charming accent. Trump answered Mrs. Clinton's criticism by strangling his humpback guard, tearing his chains from the castle wall, and descending into a nearby Bavarian village where he mistook a little girl for a flower and threw her into a lake to see if she could float. A mob of angry villagers finally chased Mr. Trump to an abandoned mill, which they set on fire with their torches. The mill collapsed in flames, giving the impression the monster had been destroyed, but leaving the matter suspiciously open to question. Mrs. Clinton ended her speech by declaring that Mr. Trump did not have the temperament to be a good foreign policy president. She said, quote, at any moment that man could do something absolutely crazy, like kill Islamic terrorists or enforce our immigration laws. This would completely reverse the foreign policy President Obama has been carefully building in order to lose the friendship of our allies and encourage the ambitions of our enemies. I hereby pledge to you that a Hillary Clinton administration will stay the Obama course and ensure that our national decline is not just unnecessary, but irreversible. Mr. Trump hit back against Mrs. Clinton in an interview with John Dickerson on Face the Nation, ripping Dickerson's head off with his bare hands and then roasting his decapitated body over an open flame before devouring it whole on national TV. Viewers agreed Trump's actions improved both the show and Dickerson. So, election 2016 continues just about as usual. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. <laughs> you know, I, think, I think we're living, we're living in the Mar Republic. You know, you've heard of the Weimar Republic. The Weimar Republic was put into place in Germany after World War I. There was a revolution, and they brought on in a republic. So they had a much more democratic, you know, uh, a system with a president and all this stuff. And it was very wobbly, and it fell apart as the economy fell apart. They had this terrible inflation. People were pushing wheelbarrows of cash to the store to buy bread and all this stuff, and it fell apart and gave way to the Nazis. The Nazis took power. We're having, like, the same kind of craziness, the same kind of radicalness, the same kind of violence, except there's no reason. So there's no why. So it's not the Weimar Republic. It's just the Mar Republic. <laughs> All right. A long joke, but it was, it was worth it, wasn't it? <laughs> All right. So unfortunately, Muhammad Ali could not survive the Clavenless weekend. So we're here without him. The rest of us have to push on. We'll talk about Ali. We'll talk about We have a lot of stuff to talk about. I, it's both D-Day and the beginning of Ramadan. Done, so that we'll put those together and insult Muslims. I think that'll that should work. And then we'll, but we really, and also I want to remind you also to subscribe so you can be part of the mailbag on Wednesday when we will answer all your questions, personal questions, philosophical questions, political questions, whatever you want to know, romantic things. We, we'll, we'll do it all, whatever you want to say. But you got to subscribe. It's free for 30 days, and then it's like eight bucks a month or something like that. So uh, the thing I really want to talk about, though, and I know, you know, it's, there's breaking news, there's things moving forward. We have the California primary coming up and the New Jersey primary and other states. That'll be pretty much the end, obviously, of the Democrat primaries. There's one more in Washington, D.C., I think, uh, mid-month. But this is coming to the place where it's going to end, and we'll be talking about that. We'll talk about that a little more tomorrow, because there's something I really have to talk about that happened last week that 
I, I think, you know, I don't want the news cycle to pass it by without bringing it closer to, you know, more front and center in your attention, which is the violence that has been taking place at Trump rallies. I mean, it happened in our state here in, uh, in San Jose Thursday night. It, it was an appalling spectacle. And one of the reasons it's so important to me to talk about it is because I have been scoring Trump from the beginning for his violent rhetoric. I've called him a proto-fascist, and people were attacking me on Twitter when this thing happened. They were saying, well, you called him a proto-fascist. What's this? Well, this is fascism. This is real fascism. And yes, he is a proto-fascist. All that violent talk about beat up the uh, protesters and punch that guy in the mouth and I'll pay your legal fees, all of it, bad, bad stuff, but nothing, nothing like what happened in San Jose. This was a spectacle I, like I just never, ever thought I would see. And, you know, you know the thing is, guys like... You know, Milo Yiannopoulos, uh, all these guys on the alt-right, they think this stuff is funny. It's not funny because, you know, when you deal with evil, your irony, your irony doesn't mitigate the evil. The evil just takes over the irony. The only way to deal with evil is by doing the right thing. I'm going to run Tom, ABC's Tom Yanis's report from the San Jose scene. I'm going to let it run pretty long. The thing about, this is an excellent report. It's on the Stephanopoulos GMA show. You know, I, I run down the news media constantly. I've lost all respect for them. I think they are a corrupt uh, organization. They are Democrats, basically, with press cards. But all of this is true of the managers. The guys on the street, whatever their politics, are frequently trying to get the truth out. The street reporters, and I, I've been a reporter and I've been in the news business, the street reporters are constitutionally created to get the news. And what so often happens is they report the news and the guys at the top, the Scott Pellies and the managers whose names we don't know, they kill their stories if they're anti-Obama. They're the guys who've been sitting on Obama stories. Scott Pelley has been so uh, negative, so he has struck down so many anti-Obama stories, stories that put Obama in a bad light. The reporters don't even want to be on his show. This is the flagship show of CBS, and the reporters don't want their stories on because they feel he's that dishonest. So Tom Yanis is doing an excellent, excellent job reporting at this San Jose rally, and he, he just tells you what the chaos is like, and you can see it if you subscribe. This was one of the most violent scenes I have ever witnessed at a Trump rally. At times, it seemed like the police had no control of the situation. People were getting beat up right in front of them. And these were not clashes. These were pure attacks. Trump supporters, men, women, even the elderly, left this building last night and walked right into danger. Overnight, all-out brawls outside the Trump rally in San Jose, California. Trump supporters harassed, beaten, and bloodied by mobs of protesters. They were like spitting on me and stuff. This man says he was sucker punched, his clothes torn off his back. Like seven more people just come in, start punching me. Carl, I look pretty bad. This lone female Trump supporter tried to stand her ground. Her sign torn from her hands, her glasses ripped off, then shoved in her face. A woman wearing a Trump jersey cornered and then egged in the face. Nazis go home! Fights Nazis. breaking out in the streets all over the convention. Inside, Trump spoke to a large and welcoming crowd. We're going to build that wall, don't even think about it. But outside, protesters accused Trump of being a racist and hunted down the people that support him. Another fist fight's about to break out right now. Trump supporter is getting pummeled right now. That man eventually fighting his way back to police. At another point, protesters followed this couple, violently harassing them, then storming the parking lot where they tried to escape. Protesters shaking cars and smashing taillights. Drivers forced to hit the gas to get out. Police were there, armed in riot gear, but from what we witnessed, reluctant to initially stop or engage the protesters. Then this, a young man running in fear from protesters, then getting tackled before breaking free. We point him to police. There's a cop over there. This Trump supporter walking with his wife, spat on, bottles thrown at them, then punches. He says it was the only way he could get out. What am I going to do? I had, you know, 10 people throwing punches at me. This is 
so disgusting, that spectacle of that woman surrounded by these thugs, a lot of them wearing masks, by the way, if you couldn't see it, a lot of them dressed up so you can't tell who they are, the police standing by, and I know the police have a, a very tough time of it, but later on, the police chief and the mayor came out with a statement that was just disgusting, basically blaming Trump for this and you know not taking responsibility for the fact that they let this get out of hand. This is the face of fascism. And when it, by the way, one of my real objections to right-wing radio in general is the overuse of terms like fascism and tyranny and this kind of, uh, everything gets hyped up. And this is just part of what the media has to do to keep your attention because you turn them off if they don't get you excited, you know, if you don't get people ginned up, then people don't listen. And so they, you know, if, if Obama misuses an executive order, people start shouting tyranny, tyranny. That's not tyranny. That's the kind of thing that happens in a democracy. It needs to be spotted. It needs to be shouted down. This is tyranny. This is when people can't go to a rally without being surrounded, without being chased down, hunted down like animals. That, that's fascism, okay? And there's nothing, there's no excuse, nothing Trump has done, nothing Trump has said it make, gives an excuse for that. So here comes Hillary. We're going to play the third Hillary cut. And Jake Tapper has her on, and he asks her, will she denounce this? And here's her milk toast, uh, lukewarm reply. I condemn all violence in our political uh, arena. I condemned it when Donald Trump was inciting it, and congratulating people who were engaging in it. I condemn it by those who are uh, taking violent uh, protests to physical assault uh, against Donald Trump. This has to end. He set a very bad example. He created an environment in which it seemed to be um, acceptable for someone running for president to be inciting violence, to be encouraging his supporters. Now we're seeing people who are against him responding in kind. It should all stop. It is not acceptable. That's just garbage. That's garbage. The hell with her. And Jake Tapper presses her, and she doubles down. Listen to it. Listen to her get even more mealy mouth as Tapper pushes her. They play the fourth cut. At the end of the day, do you think that those violent anti-Trump protesters actually might be helping him in a in a way by by showing his opposition in such a horrendous light? I don't think any of this helps anybody. I don't think his protests uh, that were led by his supporters beating up people who were uh, peacefully protesting against Trump helped Trump. And I don't think that people who are protesting and using uh, physical violence against people supporting Trump are helping anybody. So I wanted to just end, Jake. I don't want to parse it. I don't want to talk about the political implications. I want it to end. The police have a hard enough job trying to make sure that we're able to gather and talk about the issues facing our country. And Trump has lowered the bar. And now, is it a surprise that people who don't like him are stepping over that low bar? I don't think it is. He needs to condemn all violence by everyone. I already have. I will continue to do so. Oh, nonsense. You know, he lowered the bar, so you stepped over it. You know, it's like you raised your skirt, so I raped you. You know, this is like one newspaper says Trump inspired violence. That is like it's like woman inspired rape. It's this is this is absolute garbage. And it, it's even more garbage because of this. Here is Tammy Bruce. Tammy Bruce, a pal. She wrote this excellent piece in The Washington Times this morning. I'll, I'll read you as much of it as I can. From Chicago to Albuquerque to San Diego and now last week's obscene riot in San Jose, California, Americans and the world saw supporters of the liberal agenda violently target Trump supporters, peacefully trying to attend a rally as though they were prey. Make no mistake, the supposed anti-Trump riots are not organic, nor are they natural. They are the result of leftist organizing using paid stooges. Fox News reported in March a Craigslist ad posted by Bernie Sanders supporters offering $15 an hour to protest at a Trump rally in Wisconsin. They would also provide shuttle bus transport, parking if you needed it, and ready-made signs. Yeah, not organized at all, just natural upset citizens who are so passionate about the situation they just can't help themselves. And if you believe that, I have a YouTube video for you that caused a bunch of passers-by in Benghazi to riot, too. When confronted with the fact that the organizers of these melees are Bernie Sanders supporters and representatives from Democrat-allied groups like La Raza and MoveOn.org, the Democratic Party establishment denies, denies, denies. They then condemn the violence with one hand while their allies perpetrate, 
perpetrated. The latest embarrassment for the Democrats and the country was last Thursday when Americans watched in horror the video of liberal protesters at a San Jose Trump rally violently attacking people who were trying to attend the event. The American flag was burned, cars were attacked, people were spat upon, punched in the face, and beaten. This is what liberals have been doing since the 60s, Tammy goes on. They've done it here in Europe and South America. The left always resorts to violence because they cannot win on the issues. The policies of Hillary and Bernie destroy lives. Lives, and the only way to keep you in line, like a batterer, is to keep you too afraid to leave them. They hope you'll be intimidated into surrendering or at least will be distracted and not notice that they've already set the nation on fire, but it's already too late. The Democrats and their allies simply don't understand trying to beat us into submission reaffirms our determination to end this charade. That's T Tammy Bruce in the Washington Times. And by the way, by the way, that uh, moveon.org, remember, is a George Soros-supported entity and he is a big Hillary Clinton person. This is not just Bernie's people. This is Hillary's people. She knows exactly what's going on. And, you know, I, I've, I've denounced the words that come out of Trump's mouth. But when Hillary Clinton talks about protests at which people are beaten, Trump protests, that's never happened. That has never happened. Once or twice, somebody's gotten out of line and punched somebody. I condemned it. I condemned the fact that Trump didn't condemn it. That is proto-fascism, but this is the real thing. And it's in keeping, Tammy is right, it's in keeping with what the left does. You remember that thing that just happened in Yale not long ago around Halloween, where one of the masters of the house was trying to defend the idea that you could dress up in any damn Halloween costume you wanted to instead of being culturally aware and worried about who you were going to offend. And you remember that the uh, Nicholas Christakis, his name was, went out and tried to explain his point of view to a mob, a mob of Yale students. And Yale students, listen, my son was one of them. They are the most privileged people in the world. God bless them, acting like a bunch of thugs. Listen to this again, just to remember what it was like. Other people have rights too, not just walk, you. Walk away. Walk away. He doesn't deserve to be listened to. He doesn't deserve to be listened to. Unsafe here. I did not. Be quiet. For all standing to you understand that? As your position as master, it is your job to create a place of comfort and home for the students that live in Silliman. You have not done that. By sending out that email, that goes against your position as master. Do you understand that? Then no, I stop. don't agree with that. Then, then why the f did you accept the position? Because what I have the a f hired you! I have a different vision. You should step down! See, that's fascism, too, and that's violence, too. And by the way, there was a piece in the Wall Street Journal over the weekend talking about the fact that they hounded this man, Christakis, and his wife, Erica, who are, both of whom are total liberals, by the way, because these guys always eat their own. They, they hounded them out of their position while the administration not only stood by but basically supported the people who were hounding them. This is the face of fascism. This is fascism. This is what it's like, and it's always the same excuse. It's always translating words into actions. You said this, and that oppressed me. You did thought this, and that oppressed me. You, you, know, you took this action or said these words or think, thought this thought and put this forward, and that oppressed me. So I have the right to respond with violence. You elevate language to an action of violence, and then you can respond in violence. And it's always around this issue of racism. You know, it's always around this whole issue. You know, I don't even know why the left opposes racism. I don't even know. You know, they tell me that all morality is relative. They tell me that every culture is the same as every other culture. So why is a racist culture worse than a non-racist culture? I don't get it. I know why I'm opposed to racism. I know why I'm opposed because it says that God created man in his image. And then after that, God came down to earth and zipped himself into a Jesus suit and told, told us that to love him meant to love our neighbor. That's why I oppose racism. That's why. And, and none of that. Just like, you know, the, they're always saying about religious people that they won't listen to the facts. I won't listen to the facts. Nothing you can tell me, nothing you can tell me scientifically about black people or Mexicans or anything is going to make me hate them because I know where they come from and I know whose image they're created in and I know my obligations to them. Why are, why, what does the left care? What is, if, if it's all relative, you know, let's just have a racist culture. Why not? You know, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get why they're so excited. Nothing they say makes sense. Which brings me to Donald Trump and the judge, okay? Donald Trump is now under attack for his racist remarks about Judge Gonzalo Curiel. Uh, Gonzalo Curiel is a, an American of Mexican descent. He is presiding over this case of this lawsuit uh, of Trump University, people claiming Trump University was a fraud. Trump's argument is that Curiel, that the plaintiff in this suit, came forward and basically praised Trump University, and so the, they got rid of the plaintiff and continued the suit. And Trump is saying, no, that's not fair. If you get rid of the plaintiff, the suit is over. So he says, Curiel hates me. 
because he's Mexican and I want to build a wall. So Jake Tapper challenges him on this. Jake Tapper, who is now like the only journalist left in America who's asking anybody anything. That's why he's here so often. So Trump is defending himself. He won't take it back. If you were giving me fair rulings, I wouldn't be talking to you this way. He's giving me horrible rulings. I don't care if you criticize him. That's fine. You can criticize every decision. What I'm saying is, if you invoke his race as a reason why he can't do his job. I think that's why he's doing it. But I think that, that's why he's doing it. When Hillary Clinton says it's Hillary, a racist Hillary attack. Hillary Clinton is a stiff. If Hillary Clinton Paul becomes Ryan today, Paul I mean, Ryan today said he, he didn't care for the way that you were attacking this judge. Look, I'm just telling you. Paul Ryan doesn't know the case. Here's the story. Isn't it the death? Defin- I should have won this case on summary judgment. This is not a case. This is a case I should have won on summary judgment. Do you know the law firm paid Hillary Clinton hundreds of thousands of dollars to make speeches? Do you know the law firm? I has, do. And we've reported, oh, we were, oh. we've reported it on my show. Okay, in good. Fact. Well, I'm glad. You're the only one. The but law firm, was, wait a minute. The law firm paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to Hillary Clinton for speeches. Before either of you she were running for president. She wasn't worth it. Everybody fell asleep during a speech. Before okay? either of you were running for president, they did. But here's the, just the, the fundamental question. Do you know that they've contributed tremendous amounts of money to her campaign? Yes. Do you know they've contributed a lot of money to Eric Schneiderman, the, the New York Attorney General? Here is my question. No, no. Do you know that? I did not know that. Do you know that these people went to every Attorney General practically in the country that they could? And do you know this case was turned down by almost every Attorney General from Texas to Florida to many of these uh, states? Is it not when Hillary Clinton says this is a racist attack and you reject that? If you are saying he can't do his job because of his race, Is that not the definition of racism? No, I don't think so at all. Well, of course it is. Of course, Tapper's right. It is the definition of racism. He is mean. Unless he has proof. Listen, it's possible that somebody might not like Trump because he's... He's going to build a wall. A Mexican guy of Mexican descent might not like Trump. That's possible. It could happen. The guy may target him for that. You got to have proof before you go racial on a guy. You got to have proof. But let me just point out again. One of the things that we object to about Trump, or just about everybody here at the Daily Wire objects to about Trump, is that he's basically essentially a leftist. And one of the things, whenever, when the New York Times runs a headline that says, white cop shoots unarmed black teen, they are telling you the same thing Trump is, is telling you. They are telling you that that, black, that cop acted because of his race. They are communicating that before anybody has any proof. They do it again and again and again. A white cop who shot a black teen, an unarmed black teen, Always the same story. They are implying exactly what Trump is saying out loud. He is only sinking to the level of the left. And when, even when he encourages violence, he is only sinking to the level of the left. The violence is inherent in the leftism, and it has been that way for years, and it's that way every time they shout down Ben Shapiro at a college or any other speaker at a college, and those, that, that woman was guilty of a kind of, of fascist silencing and intimidation that we've seen from the left for years. You know, all these years, people have been writing me saying, the left lies, shouldn't we lie? The left is uh, intimidate, shouldn't we intimidate? And I keep saying, no, because we're the good guys. Well, congratulations, you've got the guy who is going gonna, gonna to bring you what you want, but I'm not sure you're going to like it. I don't think you're going to like it. I don't like it. All right, let's talk about Muhammad Ali. But before we talk about Muhammad Ali, we have to say, you know, the, one of the best things written about Muhammad Ali after his death at 74 uh, was by John Nolte, uh, one of the people I like best on earth and who is now writing for the Daily Wire. I'm so thrilled. And, and a Trump supporter, which says a lot of good things about the people who run the Daily Wire, including Ben and Jeremy Boring, that they have brought on somebody they disagree with to represent that point of view. Nobody can do it better than Nolte. I, Nolte is one of the best observers of the modern media. And one of the reasons I think he likes Trump so much is that Trump trashes the media. Muhammad Ali died. Nolte wrote politically. This is what John wrote for the uh, Daily Wire. Politically, culturally, and socially, Ali and I agreed on practically nothing. As a young man, the newly crowned heavyweight champ, fresh from his earth-shattering upset over Liston, announced his conversion to Islam and membership in Elijah Muhammad's bizarre and racist Nation of Islam cult. He would later refuse to serve his country in Vietnam and end his life as a globalist. Me, I'm a patriotic Roman Catholic who firmly believes that one of America's great sins was abandoning our allies in South Vietnam. When it comes to how the world should be, Ali was the furthest thing from my North Star, and as remarkable as they were, Ali's athletic accomplishments have little to do with my admiration for the man. What I admire about Ali is that he was something incredibly rare and courageous, one of the hardest things to be during his time or any time. Muhammad Ali was his own man. You know, 
th- that's a beautiful sentiment, and it's part of Nolte's wonderful open mind. Uh, I don't entirely agree with it. I'm not a hero worshiper in the sense that I don't look at people who do great things well or think, do things greatly and think that they should somehow represent who I should be. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, gray area in what Ali did. You know, he was... They took three years of his life away for the fact of his fighting life away. He was banned from the ring because he wouldn't go to Vietnam on religious principles. If he had been a white Quaker, if he had been a white uh, Roman Catholic and had refused to go to um, go to Vietnam, I don't think they would have done to him what they did. The Supreme Court ultimately let him back in with a unanimous verdict. But the thing about it is, is forget about all that. He was one of the very few people who says I'm the greatest who was the greatest. He was a thing of beauty, and a thing of beauty, as John Keats said, is a joy forever. More than that, John Keats says something else. He said, beauty is truth, and truth is beauty, and that's all you know on earth. And, you know, there is something about someone who does something at this level which is inspiring in ways that transgress, that go beyond, that transcend inspiring in ways that transcend his politics, his opinions. If he had been an evil man, that would take away from what he did. But he wasn't an evil man. He was a man trying to find his way in a very, very difficult time. And he was an absolutely beautiful, beautiful athlete when he fought. I love boxing. I love watching two people pound uh, each other to death. I think it's a, it's a great scientific sport re- uh, requiring immense courage. He had immense courage, and he had a style like nothing I have ever seen. If he was not one of the 100 greatest athletes who ever lived, certainly in America, uh, you know, I don't know who is. And it's just, it's just a wonderful thing to see. And you have to look. You know, humanity is broken. Nobody's perfect. This guy did something great, greatly. And I think that that's worth remembering. And I was really sorry. He's one of the very rare ce- celebrities. When I heard about his death, I went, oh, you know, <laughs> he, was, he was one of the greats. All right, Stuff I Like. And this is interesting. This actually leads in to what I have to say about Stuff I Like. There there was a show on AMC, a six-part miniseries based on a John le Carré novel called The Night Manager. Uh, It's just a wonderful, wonderful spy story, exciting, well-plotted, so brilliantly acted. Hugh Laurie at this point. I I remember Hugh Laurie. I lived in England. He was like a minor, not a minor comedian. He was maybe a major comedian, but he just has become one of the great, great actors. Tom Hiddleston is in it. Basically, he's the hero. It's like an audition for the next Bond movie. He will make a great uh, James Bond. Elizabeth Debicki, who is one in a long line of willowy blondes whom I have fallen and madly in love with uh, since I was 10 years old, including my wife. I uh, love those long willowy blondes, and she is just beautiful in it. You know, one of the things that has happened to Le Carre is he was, I think he was one of the greatest novelists of his day. I think when the Berlin Wall was up, when the Soviet Union was active, he chronicled the Soviet Union when so many artists were ignoring what was going on. When the wall came down, he unfortunately, I believe, partakes of this British Orientalism that romanticizes Islam. And he could not confront the fact that Islam was the great evil of our age. Islamism, I would say, is the great evil of our age. Islamism is the great evil of our age. And the great question of our age is whether Islamism is inherent in Islam or is it a cancer on Islam. And that's a question for experts to debate openly and honestly without being afraid and without being uh, um, intimidated. Le Carre has lost that train, and he makes all his villains now are arms dealers. And we're supposed to get all upset that people are selling arms, but the fact is people can't sell arms unless somebody buys them. If you get rid of one arms dealer, another will take his place. But if you get rid of a bad philosophy, you can have a good 10 years before a new bad philosophy springs up. Islamism is a very bad philosophy, and everything in the arts, everything in the arts, is meant to avoid discussing it. All these superhero movies... They're there. The reason we have superhero movies is not just because of the spectacle. It's because people don't want to make movies in which Islamists are the villain. Instead, you can have like an octopus guy comes out and it, you know destroys a city. You know, there's a new movie, the sequel to Independence Day is coming out, and it shows the, in the posters in L.A. It shows Europe in flames, and the cut line is they picked on the wrong planet. Well, th- that's about terrorism. They're telling you about terrorism, but nobody wants to admit who the terrorists are, so they make it about aliens from outer space. <clears throat> that has forced the arts to stop discussing the great subject of our time, which is this culture clash that's going on. And that's one of the problems with the night manager. And because it's a problem with the night manager, it becomes very simplistic morally. However, 
However, there is just nobody who can do character like Le Carre. There's nobody who can do drama, and the acting is great, and the locations are great, and just everything about the show is as entertaining as it can possibly be. So in the same way that Ali uh, presented a beautiful, beautiful thing that maybe you don't want to take uh, as a as a as a philosophical truth, you know, maybe the words coming out of his mouth weren't philosophical truths while his art was beautiful. In the same way, the night manager is as interesting and exciting as it can possibly be without really dealing with the issues that Le Carre was so good at dealing with when he dealt with the Soviet Union. What he knew about the Soviet Union was that as bad as the West can be, and we can all be corrupt and make mistakes and do terrible things, what he understood was that as bad as the West can be, the Soviet Union was worse. And he can't bring himself to say that about Islamism and Islam in the Middle East. He just can't bring himself to say it, so he can't write the great books that he used to write. Still, The Night Manager is as entertaining as it can possibly be. It's stuff I like, and I recommend it. All right, tomorrow we'll come back and we'll talk about California, because California, here we come. It's going to be really interesting. Some really interesting stuff is popping up. I'm Andrew Clavin. This is The Andrew Clavin Show. Come back tomorrow, and we'll talk all about it.